All right. Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Dr. Tamisha Price Brock and I'm your facilitator today. I'm a music educator with 16 years of teaching experience, eight on the K-12 level and eight in higher education. I currently serve as a director of bands at Basic Academy of International Studies and as the owner and professional development specialist of Prodigious Music Concepts LLC based here in Las Vegas, Nevada. The purpose of today's webinar is to shed light on mental health, increasing awareness of mental health disorders, and addressing these disorders that are affecting our music majors, faculty and staff, and administrators nationwide. I am truly honored today to be joined in this initiative by four wonderful women who are very influential and successful in their fields. My guest panelists today are Dr. Lanisha Williams, LCPC CEO of Dr. W, Dr. w Consultations LLC in Nevada, Professor Troy Banks Smith, LCSW, owner of L. Smith & Associates in Richmond, Virginia, Professor Stephanie Sanders, Assistant Professor of Music, Associate Director of Bands and Jazz Ensembles Director at Norfolk State University in Norfolk, Virginia, and Professor Roxanne Stevenson, Director of Bands, Music Education and Gospel Music Coordinator at Chicago State University in Chicago, Illinois. We will start with Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, can you briefly tell us about yourself? Yes, hello everyone and thanks for being here. My name is Dr. Lanisha Williams. I am a licensed clinical professional, professional counselor located in the state of Nevada. I am originally from Chicago, Illinois. I've been working in behavioral health for 15 years, um, serving, serving in various capacity, primarily in leadership roles. I am currently the owner of my private practice where I provide um, individual couples and family therapy. I'm also a contract therapist and a consultant for two other mental health agencies here in Nevada. And I am in the process of launching a consultation group for professionals in the field of mental health. Thank you. Professor Smith, can you briefly tell us about yourself? Uh, Latroy Smith. I'm based in Richmond, Virginia. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have a, a small um, therapy uh, practice. Um, I've been in mental health for about 20 years, um, working with, uh, uh, I have, I've had a group home, working with individuals with HIV, um, uh, just all over, all over the place. Um, but right now, um, my focus is on, uh, I'm a clinical supervisor for a, a small agency where we work on uh, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, um, and, or people, and people with bipolar um, disorder. In my practice, in my therapy practice, I see um, children as young as five on up to um, adults. So just a variety of mental health conditions. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Professor Sanders, please tell us a little about yourself. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Stephanie Sanders. I'm actually originally from, I'm actually from Houston, Texas, uh, but I um, assistant professor of music and associate director of bands and jazz ensemble director here at Norfolk State University uh, in, in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I've been teaching for about over 30 years. Um, I taught public school, taught high school, actually taught uh, um, private lessons, uh, taught at uh, MacArthur High School, taught at Prairie View, taught at Alcorn, and my current stay now uh, that I love is Norfolk State University. So good to see you all this evening. Thank you. And Professor Stevenson, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, good to see everybody today. And I am Professor Roxanne Stevenson. I am a full professor at Chicago State University. I've been teaching now, this is my 38th year teaching music. I've taught every, every grade level from preschool through middle school, elementary school. I've had junior high, I taught in Gary, Indiana, Chicago. And I've been at the university now, this is year 29 for me at the university. Um, I'm responsible for all of the everything band. I'm over woodwinds, um, and I, as I say, I, I wear many hats. We started a gospel music concentration that we're still pushing through the process through NASM. So I am over music education and uh, the director of bands. I have jazz band, concert band, marching band that we just started last year, and woodwinds. So, and at this time, without, uh, other than my chairperson, I am senior faculty in our department. Thank you. 
Okay, we're gonna jump right in. Our session today is interactive and we would like for our participants to interact by posting your questions and comments into the chat box today. We will have a brief question and answer session at the end of our presentation and we'll be sure to take the time to answer each of your questions at that time. Now let's take a closer look at mental health. I want you to think for a moment about mental health and what the term means to you. When you think about stress, what is your definition of stress? What is stress to you? Feel free to type your answers into the chat. Okay, if you're just joining us, um, we're doing an interactive session in the chat. Um, and the question is, what do you think about stress? What is your definition of stress? What does it mean to you? And we're asking all of our participants to type your answers into the chat box. Okay, an overwhelming feeling of uncertainty that you may not be able to overcome. Definitely, that's, that's a heavy answer right there. Okay, let's see what other answers we have. I know some people say, man, I could write a book about this, <laughs> about what stress is. Um, Professor Sanders, would you um, like to share what you feel your definition of stress is? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I can honestly say that um, I feel that stress is um, an unnerving um, sense uh, when you when that 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 gets you out of your kilter um, with handling situations, family, personal things um, from from the job, um, and sometimes things that you can control, and sometimes things take control of you. And um, one thing that I do love with with this um, this uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoominar, I call it, uh, that we have uh, this evening is uh, to just really define that because I'll just say as as African Americans, we sometimes dismiss it, and I don't want to step on any toes from uh, my panelists on things, but uh, we we kind of dismiss things sometimes, and or we try to help ourselves, just like uh, for example, when we get sick. I think the the remedy we use is ginger ale uh, instead of taking medicine. <laughs> so it's like one of those situations that we have to deal with. <laughs> Indeed, and I see that um, Mr. John has said honestly, I've never given that serious thought, and that's that's true. Some of us really don't um, take the time to think about what we think stress means. But he said for uh, for him, it is anything that causes unnecessary discomfort. So we're often like it makes us feel uncomfortable or out of our zone. Uh, Professor Stevenson, what do you feel your definition of stress is? Well, I think it's when you really have no idea at the time how to answer a problem. And I thought about this earlier when you talked about just stress and how you handle it. And my way of handling stress is probably the most unhealthy way you can handle it. And that is, you would never know that I'm stressed out if I don't tell you. And that's not good. But it's not having... Uh, a clear path to whatever it is that you want and not knowing exactly what how to get to that answer that for me would be stress and so my way my best way of handling it is anytime i think uh I, I, if something is going on or whatever i try to figure out different answers and i write it down and i put it on paper and that way i release myself from having to remember it and continuing to rehearse it in my head and that gives me a little bit of peace but it's the things that take away my peace is the thing that i consider stress okay. thank you that's that's powerful as well something that takes away your peace and i think sometimes that can be more than just a situation it can be a person sometimes that you know that causes that stress or takes away your peace your understanding um dr williams could you elaborate for us a little bit on mental health and give us a general definition yeah and I was also going to say, just, just going back to stress, stress is, can be an emotional um, or physical tension. Um, and it's, it's represented in many different ways. 
Um, so that's all I had to say on, on stress, uh, <laughs> in my opinion. But, you know, mental health includes emotional, psychological, you, you know, your social well-being. Um, it affects how we think, how we feel, how we act. Um, it can also determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others, um, and how we make choices. So mental health is important at every stage of your life, from childhood to adulthood. Um, we'll probably get into, into some different types of uh, mental health disorders, I would say. Um, but I just wanted to touch on the stigma associated around mental health. And I'll, you know, let my counterpart, uh, Professor Smith, um, just jump into whatever you want to. Um, it is it's the stigma around mental health is like it's only psychosis so it's people are crazy or you know they're talking to themselves they don't know what's going on um but that's not all that mental health is anxiety um depression adjustment those are all also forms of mental health yeah thank you uh professor smith um Going off of what um, Dr. Williams said, what are some common mental health disorders that we may be familiar with, but may not associate them as being a mental health disorder or ailment? I mean, a lot of times I think we just have a skewed opinion of what mental health is, and we might be dismissing, um, I guess, symptoms that are actually mental health ailments. Well, um, I, I do believe, um, um, like, like my counterpart was talking about uh, the stigma is that um, specifically in the African American community, I think that um, there is a dismissiveness that happens, not because we don't care uh, about our loved ones, but because we don't have the resources. Um, many times our parents, you know, I, I heard someone the other day on Facebook um, um, say that when I told my mother that I was depressed, she said, take them to take that depression out on them dishes, you know. So um, a lot of times it will just they'll push us into the spirituality piece, where, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, if you tell somebody who is experiencing schizophrenia or, you know, um, um, hearing voices and you tell them to pray on it, uh, they, little, they need a little bit more than prayer to, you know, make those voices go away. Um, so I just, you know, just want to point out that the, um, the stigma is a thing that make people shy away from it. And, um, and you know, just, it's generational because um, at one point, if you did have a diagnosis or you did go to, um, here in Virginia, we have a central state, that's our, um, uh, where we send our crazy people back in the day, then it was kind of a um, stigma on the family. So, um, so I just want to put that out there that all of us experience depression, um, but we're not meant to um, lie down in it and stay there for a long period of time. Um, many of us experience anxiety, but it's, you're not supposed to be anxious for long periods of time. So I heard someone say that um, stress to them was an uneasiness or um, a discomfort. Exactly right. And something was, uh, that was profound to me and told to me years ago is that a disease and a discomfort will turn into a disease that's this ease will turn into a disease so think about being um anxious for a long period of time why wouldn't that morph into an ulcer you know um think about um um you know being um depressed for long periods of time why wouldn't that turn into um you know headaches and it, ju it just shows up in the body so um um you know uh Miss Brock, I'm trying to think of my my professional um, my names, um, but there's a host of things that um, that can come out and spill over, you know, that are signs of uh, a mental illness. So um, I just say, you know, I tell my clients, be aware of your body. Your body is on it. It is always trying to tell you something. Um, you know, some survivors of sexual assault, they get a bad feeling about somebody and they can feel it in the pit of their stomach. But because they've been conditioned when they were being abused of, no, you are right, you, you know, X, Y, and Z, then you tend not to follow your gut. Um, or, you know, the, the irritability because you're having a lack of sleep. Your body is always trying to tell you something. I think we've just been conditioned not to listen to it. Um, so that'll often get us into trouble. Um, 
So I just close by by saying that um, there's a host of disorders that are out there. Um, you know, if we could just listen to our body and do a body scan, um, you know, uh, it's always giving you signals and signs that something is off. Um, just give you an example, like depression. Um, some of us in our depression, we sleep a whole bunch. So if I sleep for ten hours and I'm still tired, I might be in a depressive, um, you know, a depressive uh, stance. Um, if I, you know, eat too much or eat too little all of that is you know a change in my behavior and and that's probably leading me to you know giving me warnings that something's going on with me thank you so much thank you the purpose of this webinar of course is to increase awareness of mental health struggles and the understanding that mental health disorders are treatable dr williams can you elaborate just on the fact that mental health is something that is treatable and in many cases curable Yes, it, it definitely is treatable. There are various things and, and various um, <laughs> um, symptoms that you have to pay attention to when it comes to mental health, as Professor St Smith stated. Pay attention to your body. Um, be aware of, your, of the things that activate your um, mental health symptoms, I would say, and pay attention to the precipitating factors. Um, going to see a therapist, um, you have to take a multidisciplinary approach when it comes to mental health. It's not just about um, being on medication, seeing a psychiatrist. Um, you can see a therapist. Um, you also can talk to your medical providers about symptoms that you're having or things you're feeling. Um, most of the time when we're having issues related to our body that can be caused by stress, we go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm having a heart attack or, you know, which, which is also can be addictive of having a panic attack. Um, so just pay attention, be mindful, it's treatable, um, curable. I want to say that when you're speaking of mental health, it's an ongoing thing um, because you want to make sure that you are practicing um, some positive um, mental health uh, activities and, and, and um, skills as well. Thank you. While there are a number of mental health disorders, our webinar today will focus on stress, anxiety, depression, secondary traumatic stress disorder, and possibly also sleep disorders. Although we will present content geared towards college music majors and music faculty, the information we will share today will benefit students and faculty from all disciplines and all educational levels. First, let's take a look at music majors. It has been found that the traditional college ages of 18 to 25 are when mental health problems start to appear in a lot of people. Recent studies have indicated that about 35% of our students are dealing with some form of stress, anxiety, depression, or some form of mental health problem as they matriculate through their degree program. When we think about our experiences at our institutions, Professor Sanders, what are some of the things you have experienced or noticed with your students? Some of the things that I've noticed are um, they're getting depressed because they can't pass the praxis praxis exam. Um, students avoid taking the test because what they hear from their their counterparts and their friends about uh, the test, either taking it or not taking it. Um, students think their major is like cookie cut, like some other majors where you can get out in four years. When we actually start our major, our freshman year, and um, sometimes it's a little overwhelming for them. Um, some students don't have a plan when they go to school. Um, they just had a counselor in high school that just said, okay, when you graduate high school, just go to college. Um, and everyone is not meant to go to college or to have a plan what to do while they're in college. Um, students uh, don't take their major seriously. If you don't have a passion for whatever field you're in, and especially in music, if you are not eating, breathing, sleeping, and having an intimate relationship with this music, then this is not the major for you. And then also um, students take challenges, uh, take on challenges without asking for any help. They think that they can solve the world's problems by themselves. When we, we have a, a host of, of, of not only older students, graduates, alumni, professors, you know, mentors that can assist them with getting through the process of getting through school. So those are some factors that I have. 
Thank you. Professor Stevenson, what about you? What are some things you've noticed with your students? Um, for one, we've been traditionally a non-traditional institution. So we didn't, we didn't even have dorms. The school is 153 years old. We had dorms built, I think, in 1998 or something like that. So a lot of students uh, are returned students and you know, they come with a whole host of other issues. And even though they may still be first generation students, they come after they've gone to many HBCUs and other schools and life happens for them. So they come, they, they will have had to leave the other school because of financial situations or family drama or all kinds of trauma or hazing incidents. And this is just, even in the recent, now that we're getting younger students with the dorms, that we deal with students that come in, come back because they've indulged you know, a little bit too much while they're in school and they had a little more activity than they had education. And so they come back with that feeling almost of failure. And it's like, we're not allowing people an opportunity to do a redo. I mean, it's like no redo. It's you didn't finish in four years. Whereas it, that, that's one of the things. And I also see that many of the students come back with, and even our first, in, uh, first time freshmen will come in and they have other family issues. They have children already. And uh, now they need a job. They have, uh, then they see their classmates graduating before they graduate. And that causes them to go into another level of depression, anxiety, being overwhelmed. They go away to schools and, and things and, and they're told the scholarships are going to be this, this, this. And then they get there and things are not covered and they can't afford to stay. And so now they're facing FAFSA issues and all of that stresses them out. So the students come and now they're working full time and trying to go to school full time. And the consistence of the students is that they feel overwhelmed, just totally overwhelmed with responsibility. And we talk about being able to finish as, um, say we looked up criminal justice, you can finish in the 120 credit hours. Music is gonna generally take 128 credit hours. But what's more important than the number of credit hours is the number of classes. So with the criminal justice or something or any other major, you take 120 credit hours, you only had about 40 classes because their classes are worth three credit hours. With music majors, you will have 66 or so classes if you're a music ed and maybe 62 or three or whatever if you're a non-music ed person, but you are still in music because so many of our classes, classes only have one credit hour, two credit hours, but it's a lot of content that they're expected to learn. So you have students who have three or four classes in a semester, but then a music student has eight classes. So you might say, well, it's only a one credit hour class, but yeah, but you expect me to learn how to play this tuba. You know, you expect me to learn how to do these things. And now that just adds so much stress. And it's not like we can really change that because they do need all the knowledge, but we need to understand it better and try to fix how the matriculation is for our students and to fix how we financially support them. Because, you know, I know you can get, you get so much financial aid and if you have something left over, you can use it in the summer, but no music major classes are offered in the summer. You know, so it's, it, they never feel like they can win. And often they start to feel like failure. So how do you get a student that think they're supposed to graduate in four to five years, but it's taken them at least six years to finish, to keep them engaged in and that's, that's what I'm seeing as uh, some of our biggest issues, you know, uh, students finishing. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And that, yeah, definitely, um, you, you definitely hit, you know, some key factors uh, for our students. I see some of our, our participants can relate to what you said. Um, for our participants, feel free to share in the chat box some of the things you've experienced or noticed about the students that you've taught, if you've taught on the college level, or if you've taught on the high school level, some of the things that your students have come back and told you after you sent them away to college. And, you know, especially for those, you may have had students that did not finish um, their degrees or students that finished 
finish, but they finish on a wing and a prayer because they were probably stressed out the entire time. So feel free to share your experiences in the chat as well. I know that in my experience in higher ed, um, some of the biggest things my students face as music majors were the level of deficiencies they may have had coming into the program because they may have had a revolving door of band directors or may have had no band director prior to coming to college. And like Professor Stevenson said, and like Professor Sanders said, we are one of the only majors at our colleges that start our majors freshman year. We start heavy content, we filter our GE courses in each year, but we start with heavy content and major content every year um, as freshmen. And then we're the only major at any institution that requires you to have prior experience in your field prior to coming to college. You have to already know something about music in order to be a music major. No other major requires you to have prior knowledge. You can go into criminal justice, biology pre-med, and you may have taken a biology class in high school, but you don't have to necessarily have prior experience. You just have to have a desire to be in that major. So, um, you know, those are some things that have stressed my students out, having a level of deficiency and then being expected to pass a placement exam, being able to pass music theory one when they've never had theory in high school, being able to um, perform on a recital when they've never played by themselves before, never played with an accompanist before, and now we expect them to keep up with a piano player and play at tempo when this is the first experience ever. Having to perform on a jury, un not, not understanding or not addressing the fact they may have stage fright or performance anxiety and that they're great. It's like those people who are great singers in the shower, but as soon as you sing in public, you clam up. So these people, you know, we're not recognizing the performance anxiety and how that causes stress. And I've seen that in so many of my students. I recall having a euphonium player getting ready for an all-state audition and nailed the piece before we left the school. We got to the audition and he was shaking so bad the euphonium started shaking. So, you know, just that type of anxiety, you know, prevented him from, you know, being his optimum best. On the university level, I've seen some of my students change their major the second they found out they had to do a senior recital. Like we, we told them freshman year, but because they weren't ready for that level of pressure, they decided to just change to something else altogether. So those are some things. Um, and I know in the box, so yeah, the amount of testing, the amount of testing. Some of our students may be great students, but just the idea of taking a standardized test and that test being the thing that determines whether or not you can attain your career or go into the field. You know, you may have had a 3.5 GPA, but a test is gonna determine if you can teach or not, that stress, is overwhelming for some students, especially when they are the only hope for their family or they are the way out for their family. So a lot of times this, this adds a lot of undue stress and we're not always equipped to handle it. Now, I want us to think about some of the factors that may influence some of these mental health disorders in our students, in addition to what we've just mentioned. Think about the student, again, who was the first generation college student, or the student who's away from home and totally independent for the first time in their lives. Professor Sanders, um, can you think of any other factors um, that you know, our students are facing probably talking about our freshmen, but talking about our upperclassmen as well, like first generation college student being away from home, maybe even some of the peer pressures they have. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to piggyback off you about being homesick. Um, some students have never been away from home. Um, so it's just an experience. And then also adapting to college life. Um, it's an experience when you have to share a room with someone or, or some persons in a room or when I was in school, we had, we had communal <laughs> bathroom where you had to share with 32 other girls down the hall. Um, so it's different experiences of that. Um, never being on your own. Because um, some students don't have any parental support at all. Um, so they're actually on their own doing their thing, whether they're first generation or not. Um, I've had students whose parents have just put their students, you know, they just left them on the steps and said, well, you know, help my child the best way as possible to graduate. Um, so you have that. Then you have some who, students who are spoiled. So they're not used to having to fend on their own, or you've had those helicopter parents who have done everything for them, and now they have to experience life on their own. And, and it's, it's very shocking for some um, to get through that. And, and, and then my biggest factor that I have, I, I've noticed with a lot of students is uh, coping skills. They don't know how to cope 
with different things. And life doesn't hit you cookie cutter ways. You know, when, when you are hit to the far left, they don't know how to adapt or have a plan A, B, and C, and D, or if something doesn't work, I don't know how to figure out. And it just, it just freaks them out. So those are some factors that I know that I deal with with students all the time. Thank you. Professor Stevenson, would you like to add anything to that um, as far as like other factors we have not considered with our students, especially with our music majors? Well, well, I wanted to say even before saying what I had to say was that, uh, you know, I, I really think that everybody should get together and challenge the exams. We did that in the state of Illinois and we got rid of what would be the equivalent of the practice for uh, the general ed areas. We got rid of that because, you know, at what point would the music teacher need to know trig when the trig teacher does not need to know how to transpose for B flat clarinet. So we were able to get rid of that part of the exam, uh, which was un unduly targeted minority students. But um, for, for Stephanie, and you were right on point with what you were talking about with students coming in and being away from home for the first time. And one of the things too, that, that the students, when they, when they do move into your schools and our schools, then they form a community. They join a band and become a community. But that's a great thing, and then it can turn out to be a bad thing. Because if a student does not fit in well, or doesn't get along well, or they don't do trumpet or pledge trombone or whatever, then they're like pushed out of the only community they know outside of home. So they start feeling isolated. And it's nothing like isolation to make a child feel, you know, uh, some anxiety or to depress a child because they're already away from home trying to figure out life and everybody, they're 18 years old. Everybody wants you to know everything already. You know, you ought to know what you want to do with your life. No, you don't. No, you don't even know. You're gonna change your mind five, 10 times, even as an adult after you graduate. But we want them to have all of that together. Then we put them in the community. They come in and they do band or something for the summer. And now you have this group of people, but maybe you're not that good or you don't do this that well or whatever. You fall out with that group and now you're in isolation. It's like being excommunicated. So I would think that's, that's one of the things we should really think about is making sure that we make sure our community become a really healthy community for our students. You know, and that was the only thing I think that I wanted to add because Stephanie really covered it all. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Professor Smith, are there some factors um, that with our students that we have not considered as like factors that may um, promote or prompt um, mental health disorders with our students? Is there anything that we have not considered? Oh, goodness. Um, one of the things is like um, um, prior, um, like, uh, I, I don't know how to coin it, but I, I um, taught in the social work department at Virginia State. And what, what, what we were noticing is people were coming into school um, with diagnosis and um, they didn't um, share them with the school. Because you at Virginia State, I'm sure every school has their um, process, but you can go to the counseling department and um, kind of register, hey, this is what's going on with me. Maybe I need some extra testing and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. But what we found is students wouldn't say anything about it until they're hemmed up. Now you're in trouble. You're about to you know, mess up your field practicum or whatever it is. And then they're saying, oh, by the way, did you know that I had this? And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's often too late then. So I'm just saying, you know, um, somebody said it before about the, the need to be able to reach out, for, you know, for help. That's one of them. You don't tell anybody, um, hey, I have this going on after the fact and you're about to fail out. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, so that's, that's one thing. And I, um, I, I'm gonna have to go talk to my therapist after this, cause you guys are triggering stuff for me. Um, I wasn't a band major, but I played clarinet at Virginia State's marching band, but I was one of six. I was the oldest. Um, and so that sense of community that, um, that, uh, uh Professor Stevenson is talking about, I, I love my band members and, um, but boy, when I told them I wasn't going to be able to come back because I had to help my mother take care of the children behind me, oh, they didn't like that. <laughs> I felt it, you know? Um, so it's like a sense of loss. Um, but you know, I was saying 
march in front of my first interview for a real job or you know do i need to get my degree or is, am i going to hold my clarinet so that's a decision that i had um to make so that you know that's a definite so um so i would just yeah there's so many factors dr brock that is no way um I, I think to list them all um i think the main thing is to take that stigma off of our students um especially students of color because i don't know about you guys and i'm gonna i'm gonna try to encapsulate this and get off of it because i can get on my soapbox about this but um our african-american community um just you know often there's no space or place for that mess you know it's like you know cut out that nonsense i've heard stories you know where parents are like um oh yeah that happened to you that happened to me two or three times so you know suck it up buttercup and you just it's just you know again it's it's dismissive and then the um the challenge of even getting a person to reach out for help i often think about um the tuskegee study you guys you know our government has done some really negative things with us when we did reach out and thought we were getting help um so um, I do think it's helpful for celebrities and people to say, you know, yeah, I was diagnosed with bipolar. Don't be scared of it. Embrace it, you know. And if you can't name that thing, then how are you going to tame that thing? So um, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you so much. I was looking in the chat um, and some of our participants shared their experiences. I know um, Mr. Connor said, personally, as an undergraduate student, I experienced an extreme level of stress from not being able to balance the responsibilities as a music major and member of a high level university band program, leaving the practice field after 11 p.m. daily and then attempting to hit the practice room in preparation for applied lessons. Yes, a lot of the times our students, especially our music majors, we're torn between having to choose between majoring and marching band and actually majoring in the actual field. And I think sometimes, you know, we need our music majors to serve as leaders because they're some of our strongest musicians in our ensembles. But at the same time, you know, we need to, as directors, need to think of things through a new lens. We can't do um, the same thing we've done 20, 30 years ago and expect our students to be successful, especially with the new rigors of our programs, the new demands of the workforce. We have to be able to adjust with the time. I know I was watching a, a TV episode yesterday and the speaker said, you cannot um, expect Wi-Fi changes with dial-up connections, with, with dial-up practices and things like that. So we can't do some of the same things that we've done, you know, back then and expect it to be effective for our students today. Another one of our participants, Mr. Joyner, said the amount of testing we faced as undergraduate was due to the major. We tested to decide where we needed to be placed. We tested to get into the education department. We tested again to determine if we were prepared to continue as music majors. We completed the PLT in Praxis One. This, ex this excludes the number of juries, junior and senior recitals. Yes, um, it, that right there prompted something in me. My daughter, when she was in fourth grade, came home and said, you know what, I'm tired of these tests. The teachers need to take the test. Every time I turn around, there's a test, test, test. The people who are making the test need to take the test. And my daughter said that as a child. So imagine how that resonates today with some of our college students those who are not test takers or those who feel I'm doing everything you ask and still is not good enough, you're telling me that my grades and my effort and my ability and my creativity is not good enough to be in the field? So that adds some stress as well. Dr. Well, Brock, yes. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add one more. Um, I, I think it's more, more of a probing question, but I was thinking about how many of us came into the music as it was as a, could be used as a coping skill. It was pleasurable, but you know, when does it shift over into this isn't, this is, yeah, I'm getting more pain, you know, with this music opposed to, you know, the pleasure that it used to give me or, you know, when does it shift? So it's just right. a probing question. Right, indeed. Okay. And yeah, participants think about that. At what point did you actually lose the love for being in the band? Because at some point we got tired of it. Professor Stevenson. I was laughing. I said, I know it's a way on here to raise your hand. I feel like a student, you know. At one point, music for us was the, we did for the love of us. We loved it. We enjoyed making the people happy about seeing and hearing the show and everything. But at some point, it shifts where the music is about that person that's in charge instead. And so everything revolves around, and that's why rehearsal goes to 11 o'clock at night, because it makes the band director good. Doesn't make you any better of a musician or anything. So I think that's when it turns to track. It's longer about 
you know, us and the individual and feeling good and playing and, and the fun of and just acquiring your skill. It becomes about, did I please them this time? Okay. And I also wanted to say that one of the problems that I see a lot with, you know, with hands and taking up all night long is that there are no rules. And I really think that I, the, uh, the athletic association needs to step in because the athletes have rules. You can't give uh, an athlete all night long. You cannot give them no study time. You can require all these extra rehearsals and stuff like that. You can't do that to an athlete, but you can do a 10 member. And when my daughter marched in one of the HBCU bands and the uh, ball coach threatened the band and said, if you lose one more game, you're going to band rehearsal. <laughs> Oh wow. oh wow! Oh wow! That that lets you know. Oh, so it then it becomes about, you know, what are we doing for that person as opposed to what am I doing to just, you know, for my self preservation as a director. Indeed, indeed. P Professor Sanders, Sanders, would you like to add to that? Yes, I I truly would. You have students nowadays who prioritize their ensembles versus their major. Mm -hmm. They put the band on top of their major. Your major is music of some sort, whether it be music education, music performance, music media, music technology. Band is just like I always say, band is like the icing and on the, on the cake. You can eat cake. Your cake is your major. Mm -hmm. The icing is to be a participant of the band. Now, you have to participate in band if you have scholarships you know, to fulfill the requirements. But when you put so much priority, and then I'm going to be devil's advocate right now because we got music educators on here. We have some of my constituents and some of my colleagues that don't know how to handle their business and know how to work smarter. You don't have to be in band practice all night. And then I'll use this with this wonderful uh, COVID situation. Why would you be in band practice all night till 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night and we have no football season? But that's another question for, for, for another, another topic for a different day. But even in the past, um, you don't have to have that much time if you don't have, you know, you don't have your ducks in order for the students. So you're wasting their time. And then as a professor, you have to be a man enough, a woman enough to say, you know what, you guys need to go to class or we need to have study hall two times a week or things of that nature so you can see the success of a student because it's all about retention as well too. We recruit, we recruit these students, but we have to keep them here. You shouldn't be in a band one year or two years and then you're not in band because you've either failed out of school. It's enough to deal with all of the stressors of you know family life and other things that, that may happen, finances, other things, but when you're dealing with band, you have kids that are have internal strikes within what sections between the band, fraternities and sororities, all of those factors. So you have that to come into play. I just wanted to add that little tidbit. Thank you. Thank you indeed. For those of you just joining the call, feel free to um, post your comments throughout and post your questions throughout in the chat. We're going to have a brief question and answer session towards the end so that we can address all of your concerns. But I definitely um, appreciate I want you to be as interactive as possible through the chat so we can um, include you here. Hey, to, to Dr. Bob, yes. to much, I just wanted to real quick, all of the people that just came in, um, we were at band practice at Virginia State. And I just um, I, I, I kind of forgot. Um, Mr. Quentin Jordan reminded me about your um, your meeting tonight, so I dismissed practice to bring all of our music majors and staff over. So this all this group coming over are all students and music majors at Virginia State. Well, thank you. We we uh, are glad that you're here joining with us, um, and we hope that you're gaining some things today through our presentation that you can use going forward. Um, when we think about, we're talking about now the rigors of our degree program. These are some things I want you to consider as we move forward with our presentation. Think about prerequisites and defi um, deficiencies. Think about what we expect of our music majors and whether or not they're meeting these um, minimum requirements coming into our program or whether they have deficiencies. I mentioned earlier when I talked about experience of some of my students with stress is that a lot of our students come into college with no prior experience in music theory, no prior experience performing on juries or recitals or perform with an accompanist, yet we expect them to pass a music theory placement test. We expect them to pass a music history placement test and know all these composers. We expect them to be able to go on jury or recital the first semester with an accompanist and do an optimal performance um, with, you know, and 
all this in what a 50 minute lesson one time a week. So these are some things to think about as prerequisites. What do we require out of our students? We require a lot. And as I also mentioned, the music major is one of the only majors at any university that you have to have prior experience in music or prior experience in your field before starting your major. Um, think about the number of courses and credits we have to take in our program is a lot and that can be overwhelming to someone coming out of high school where they only needed 21 or 22 credits to graduate and now we're telling them they need 128 to graduate and they're just trying to wrap around their mind to them it, it seems like they're going to be in school forever. Um, difficulty with classes or not being prepared or not grasping the content in classes. This could be anything from a student um, not being used to getting up in the morning for an eight o'clock class or not understanding the content because they don't have a prerequisite knowledge of the basic skills to be able to pass theory one or be able to pass sight singing and ear training or not grasping the content because maybe we're not as prepared as we should be as educators for our lesson or we're not prepared to be able to relate it in a way to our students that they can grasp the information. We're stuck on the lecture mod model and we're not always addressing students with various learning styles or we're not addressing students with various learning disabilities. And something um, Professor Smith said earlier is that a lot of times we don't know that our music majors may have a learning disability or may have a prior stressor if they don't tell us. And I'm gonna tell you, if the student had dyslexia in high school, it's not just gonna go away because they went to college. If a student had ADHD in high school, it's not going to go away just because they went to college. If a student has a behavioral disorder, it's not going to change just because they stepped on our campus. So I think a lot of that will help us to help them grasp what's going on in their classes. Um, also competitiveness. We're a very competitive major. Students have to compete to get into our program, compete to get a scholarship, compete to maintain first chair, compete to um, become a section leader or a captain. They have to compete for rehearsal space or rehearsal time. They, and it's always that pressure of seeking perfection. We, we know as applied instructors that a lot of times we're not gonna place our students on recital if they're not ready. And they need to play that song almost near perfection to be able to go on recital or to be able to pass juries to be able to graduate. A lot of times just having to constantly be perfect, having to constantly get it right can create undue stress and pressure on our students who are trying to just make it through. They have the true passion to do it, but the pressures of the major can be very overwhelming. And then program completion requirements, again, licensure tests, student teaching, burnout. Some schools require you to test to um, take your upper level classes and then they test you again to be able to student teach and get out of school. A lot of times you may have a student with a 3.5 or 3.2 GPA, but they can't pass the practice core. And as a result, they can't take their junior and senior level classes. So right there, they have a great grades, they're passing their classes, but they're still stuck at junior status until they pass the Praxis Core or Praxis One because they can't continue on in the program. After a while, that gets extremely stressful, overwhelming, and discouraging and can cause burnout and attrition. It causes them to either change their major or just say, hey, I'm going to get a job, you know, forget school at this point. And we've lost that student because we, you know, they're, they're just so stressed out. Um, Dr. Williams, how do we identify some of these triggers or how can we tell when our students may be dealing with a mental health crisis? What, should, what are some things we should look for or listen for with our students? Simply put, any changes in behavior. Um, these students spend a lot of time with you all as, as staff um, or individuals within your respective departments. So any changes in behavior, if you notice, um, if you yourself notice that you're eating or sleeping too much or too little, if you're pulling away from people and your usual activities, um, low energy or no energy, feeling helpless or hopeless, um, those are all signs that you may be experiencing um, some type of mental health, um, having a mental health issue. I would say. Um, I like to steer away from the labels. You know, it, you know, we have a whole book, DSM-5, I think we're still in the five, um, <laughs> that is, is, is filled with diagnosis and labels and things that, you know, if you have this for this long, um, but it's simply put to just just pay attention to you and if there are any changes in behaviors um, that that's 
usually indicative that something is going wrong and that you might be able you might need to um talk to someone or or seek some assist, assistance Okay. Thank you. Um, for my participants, I want you to just think and reflect for a moment. I'm going to ask some questions and see if there's some things that you can relate to. Um, and this is for um, the professors on the call as well. Have there been times this semester or even since the pandemic started where you've had just a negative or a critical attitude at work where you just like, man, don't talk to me today. Or if one person says the wrong thing to me today, or if the teacher says this, I'm going to walk out of class. If this has been you, or have you dreaded getting up to go to class? Have you dreaded getting up to go to work? I know me personally, I had to take a personal day last Friday because it was just so overwhelming. Um, have you ever woke up, got ready to go to class and you're just so tired, you're barely making it through class. Later on, as you get going through the day, you feel better, but you're just dragging yourself to work, dragging yourself to class. Do you have trouble sleeping at night? Do you feel yourself just up constantly throughout the night? Do you, are you absent from class or not a lot? Now, I'm not going to ask you to tell on yourselves, but if you skip class a lot and you really can't explain why you skipped class, you just didn't feel like it that day, have you skipped multiple classes in a week? Have you skipped rehearsal? And if so, why? If you can't really explain why, those might be some triggers. Um, if you feel like empty, like you just feel like nothing's going right, or you just wake up and you just have a bad feeling that day, you just don't know what it is, but you just don't feel like yourself. Or if you get irritated very easily, it could be a clarinet player not playing the right note and everybody in the band just starts sucking their teeth. Or it could be that somebody missed a count off or a roll off and you're just ready to fight. You know, so if you're ever feeling like that, those may be some things that, you know, that you might want to pay attention to. Professor Smith and Dr. Williams both said, listen to and pay attention to your body. Your body is going to tell you what's going on way before you ever know that there's a problem, whether it's a back spasm, whether it's a headache, whether it's dizziness, whether it's feeling hot or flushed, you know, so just pay attention to those things. Now, of course, we can spend hours talking about and identifying and addressing mental health issues with our students, but what about with our sales professors? Not only are there rising cases of mental health disorders with our students, but there are increasing cases with our faculty, staff, and administrators as well. A recent study from the UL, UCL Institute of Education reports that one in every 20 teachers, or about 5% of our teachers and professors, suffer with a mental illness that has lasted or is likely to last more than a year. Professor Smith, can you talk to us about factors that may influence mental health disorders and burnout in the workplace? Um, uh, honestly, it's, it would be the same thing that Dr. Williams is saying um, for the professors is that, um, so we have this thing called compassion fatigue and, um, and Dr. Williams and I, we fall into that category where um, how could you not be overwhelmed with some of the stories that you hear. And I know as professors, you guys get the same thing. It's just like, oh, this baby has been through so much. Um, but I wanna, I wanna point out two things is that, um, you know, uh, Ilyana Van Zandt, who I don't like to quote that often, but she has a, she always, she talks about a cup and you have to make sure your cup is full. So whatever that means for you, you have to take care of yourself, you know, get that self care in there and a part of, balancing out your mental health is self-care. Um, so this is gonna hurt some people's feelings, but um, oftentimes in the uh, communities of color, um, we like to look good on our side. You know, I got them J's, the flaves, the this, the that. Yeah, but you're a hot mess on the inside, you know, um, because you've been suppressing that thing. And um, I tell my clients, it's like a diaper. Any of you guys have been in the house with the infant, you, it might be cold, especially you guys in Chicago. Um, you might stuff that diaper at the bottom of the trash can and say, I'll get that in the morning. But when that diaper starts humming, it'll wake you up out of your sleep. So emotions are like that. You can suppress them and stuff them down, but if you don't manage them, they gonna come out and manage you. So, um, so I would say to the professors, um, you can't be fraudulent. If you're telling people to take care of themselves, you need to do the same for yourself. Um, you need to make sure that you're doing things that fill your cup up. And then um, um, I see this in our, in our community also is that make sure that um, you, we're giving a hand up, but not a hookup. Y'all know the difference between this student is really trying and they're giving it their all, but you know, some things are in their way versus, 
you know, I, you know, I've had students come to me too. And it's like, come on, work with me. No, nah, you ain't working with me, you know, or do you have extra credit? The extra credit was in that syllabus when I told you at the beginning of the semester what we were doing. So, you know, um, so I think that that's, um, that's all I wanted to say about that. Dr. Brock, one more thing this is, is on, my, on my heart, is that um, for my males, all my males that are on the webinar, I wanna apologize to you guys um, for society because um, I don't care if you had the best parents in the world, um, society usually doesn't wanna hear from you guys as much. And, and my evidence of that is that if you have a little girl and a little boy, we'll tell that little girl, are you all right if you scrape your knee? Is the baby all right? We'll, we'll encourage them to emote. But the little boy, it's like, if we start getting into feelings with the little boy, we have this crazy mixed wire that we're gonna make them feminine or a sissy. So that's why it's really, um, Dr. Williams might be able to um, stamp this. We don't see males and then we really don't see black males and they're hurting. So if you don't take care of those emotions and you suppress them, and like I said, they're starting to manage you instead of you managing them, what do people reach for when they have trauma? Drugs? you know, um, addiction, sex addictions and things. Don't do that to yourself, it's not fair. Um, so, you know, please, please just reach out and um, get that help. And professors, um, I know you're sitting there going, oh my God, another thing on my plate. So now I'm supposed to watch the behavior of the students and you know, no, y'all know that change of behavior. It's just like the text. If you get a text from somebody, y'all know, my, my husband don't, my husband don't text that well, so he's not gonna have long drawn out sentences with the punctuation or whatever. It's just that slight. If you notice that this student is usually cheerful and all of a sudden the mood is shifted, it's just that slight. I'm gonna give you another example that you have the skill. All of you guys, and I mean, just smile. Uh, I wanna see the towel. Smile if you know what I'm talking about. Y'all know the difference between when your mother is saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and she getting ready to get a uh, shoe and hit you. You know, so my mother's was the, the tongue between the teeth, like, I told you. So it's the same way with watching your students' behavior. It's just a, a slight, you know, change in behavior, and it's going on for too long. Just reach out, because I'm going to tell you, it's going to bother you when you find out he had all this stuff going on, or he had a suicide attempt, and you saw that behavior changing. And you just were like, you know, I don't know what that is. I, I have too much on my plate. And I'd also like to add, be direct. If you, if you notice that there's a change in one of your students' behavior and you think that they, are, they have some long-lasting sadness or irritability and you think that mm, they might do something, be direct. Ask them if they plan on killing themselves or someone else, what their intent is, how they would do it. Oftentimes we shy away from the questions of suicide, but a lot of individuals are suffering with those suicidal ideations. It's our responsibilities as educators, as therapists, as clinicians, as just adults responsible for other people to ask those questions and assess the severity of it. Indeed, thank you. And definitely, um, you know, we're talking about stress and anxiety and depression and things like that. But also, you know, let's not negate the fact that sleep disorders, not being able to sleep, eating disorders. And like Professor Smith mentioned, we don't ever want to have this conversation. You know, we'll, some band directors will joke about it, some music teachers will joke about it, or we'll just act like we turn a blind ear to it. But sex addiction is also a form of stress as well. If you, if you notice, and of course, as band directors, a lot of times we know everything, students whether you tell us or not we know everything that goes on with you so a lot of times if you are jumping from partner to partner and we know that that's not your normal character a lot of times that may trigger that there's something going on in your outlet your way of dealing with it instead of going to the bottle instead of smoking maybe that you're promiscuous and it's not always that you have an issue maybe something deeper than that so um, I think that's something we need to be aware of as well, you know, and not just, you know, from professor, you know, as far as us assessing, but if you know that your peers, if you know someone in your organizations or someone in your section is just displaying different behavior, reach out to them, just talk to them, pull them aside and say, hey, is everything all right? What's going on? So, you know, don't be afraid to be that voice because you could be that saving grace from that person who decided to go back to their room and do harm to themselves or do harm to someone else. So do not be afraid to speak out. I think that's the overarching theme of today is that we need to get past the stigma of not speaking up. You know, it's okay to speak up. It's helpful to speak up as well. 
Um, Professor um, Sanders, can you share your experiences and any experiences you, you may have witnessed from like colleagues or friends in the field? I know we've talked about students, but what about some of our colleagues in the field? What, what can you share with us? Um, I know some of, the, some of the students can be able to understand when I talk about this, even though I'm talking about my colleagues sometimes, but it happens and the students know this as well as the professors know. Um, adapting to being online, some of these students are, are not, some of the teachers do not know how to, to use any type of computer. And so they, they give you guys a hard time. Um, they're struggling themselves with putting stuff on Blackboard or Canvas or whatever uh, system that you're using. Um, also thinking of different ways to think outside of the box. Uh, some teachers don't have those creative minds to think out the box. So if they've been teaching for, I'll say, you know, 40 years or more, they doing the same thing that they were taught and not adapting to 2020 on how you were taught in school. Um, thinking of various ways to keep your students safe. Um, you, they, they don't know how to handle situations because um, some of them, I'll just say some colleagues that are not dealing with band per se, I'll say band or choir, because I don't want to just earmark it just for band. But you have some uh, directors that don't uh, know how to tell you how to do things personally because they just think of their particular class or your applied teacher, it's all about applied, it's not about anything else. And so they're not willing to, to, to try to save you on things. Um, thinking of different various ways to keeping themselves safe. Um, we talk about the students, but they don't keep themselves safe. Um, dealing with students who have difficulties coping. We got professors that don't know how to cope with things. Uh, just like the students are talking about uh, committing suicide, you got professors that, that are having some challenges themselves with committing suicide. Um, having to deal with family issues. Um, I know, with this, this semester, you're dealing with what? Sickness, you're dealing with death, you're dealing with financial issues. Um, you know, not only that, you got people who have what cancer, you have all different types of things going on to deal with those factors. Their children, are the children in college or if they're teaching public school, or if you're in public school and you having to teach public school as well as your child being in public school, um, taking on too many responsibilities. Um, a lot of professors take on too many responsibilities that they can't handle their own mess. And I call it mess because it becomes mess um, instead of being prioritized of what they need to do. Um, some of the professors uh, don't have an outlet for their own. They don't have an outlet for them to reach out and do things. And uh, my last one is um, having students weigh all of their challenges on you to, to assist them and that they have nowhere. I always use it as the case, they come to you to lay on your couch, but what couch do you have to lay on to be able to express yourself to others? So those are the things that I've been dealing with uh, colleagues um, across the country and as well as some of my colleagues on, on campus. Thank you, thank you. That was really profound. Um, Professor Stevenson, would you like to add anything to that? You know, I thought about what Stephanie talked about students and the thought of suicide. Um, I, I did have a faculty member who played in my community band. She was a scientist. And she just, she took applied lessons with me, played saxophone, and she was a white lady. And she said, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm crazy. So I just, you know, we were just talking and she was really funny. She just she made me laugh all the time. But before the end of the year, you know, she did commit suicide. And now you start thinking about what was her real life, what were her real life challenges, you know, and that we ought to think of things and really take it seriously. I've had faculty members that just broke down and cried, you know, over it. And I think we're gonna talk about that a little later, the tenure process, you know, all of the stress of trying to make sure you're trying to balance academia and still have a life. And, and I think the thing that COVID did is that it moved uh, your work into your private sanctuary. So home was your free time, home was your freedom, home was your place away from all of the drama, but that's gone now. Now you're, you're sitting in my room and every day people think there's no downtime too. Um, one of the things that I had to talk with some of the faculty members about is just even the assignments that they're giving students as if 
they have nothing else to do. They figure, well, you're sitting at home, you can do this and this and this and this and this, that they would not have assigned in person. So that's, that's one of the things we have to really think about. So with faculty members, uh, yeah, we're, we're catching it hard, especially though, as I'm a band director, the last thing I want to do is write and read another paper uh, or, you know, this takes you off your kilter. I want to be in a room with a bunch of people blowing horns and that's it, you know, but, it, but it's necessary that we have to, you know, try to figure things out in the middle of this pandemic. But I think that um, one of the things that she said is, you know, make sure that we take care of ourselves. And it's really, like you said, easier said than done. But you have to find your own outlet and your own time to practice. To me, that's the hardest part. When do you get to practice your instrument? You know, when you have 12 private lesson students and you have band rehearsal and you have all of that, you know, so we are working on trying to practice self-help. So I'm... I don't know, I just wanted to throw that little bit in. Thank you. Um, I know in my personal experience, I've had challenges with stress, anxiety, and depression. I've suffered from migraines, muscle spasms, loss of energy or motivation to perform even the simplest work-related tasks at times. Sometimes my occupational stress and anxiety have also affected my daily function and my activities in my personal life. I'm thankful that although I have been able to overcome a lot of this in recent years, I still experience bouts of anxiety. I still ex experience stress from time to time, and I still suffer from those debilitating migraines and back spasms as a result of my stress. So that's something I'm still dealing with to the point that I'm medicated now um, because of the, um, the stress and the severity of these migraines. Um, I feel it is also important to talk about here is stress related um, with talking on, um, taking on the stresses and sorrows of others. A lot of times as professors and um, Professor um, Stevenson touched on this, if a student comes to us with um, the parents lost their job or they're, they're um, at risk of being evicted from their home or they don't have any food at home or in the case today, one of my former students passed away today. So that right before taking this call is like, I'm supposed to still get on this call now? And I remember that student vividly and nobody can explain what happened to this student, but he's no longer here. And so that right now is weighing on me heavily because I still have to deal with this and still try to process that I have a former student that's no longer with us. So just taking on that stress, it becomes what's called secondary traumatic stress. A lot of the times, you know, being able to handle our own, but we're also grieving for our students who've lost a loved one, our students who've lost a job, parents who've lost a job, a student who's lost a child, you know, if we have non-traditional students. So a lot of that, you know, we have to really really think about as well and make sure we're taking care of ourselves and that we recognize that not only do, do we take on our stress, but we're often, um, we're easily fall into the trap of taking on the stress of others. Um, Professor Stevenson um, touched a little bit on tenure and I'm gonna ask her to elaborate briefly. Um, before moving on, there is a level of stress associated with professors trying to achieve tenure and promotion in our departments and the stresses associated with personal and financial equality being able to be paid equal to our counterparts is just by coincidence that all of my panelists today are women. And in addition to the stresses we face with tenure, we face the stresses of gender equality as well and being a double minority in some instances as being African-American females. So Professor Stevenson, while that's for a different conversation, I would like for you to uh, speak briefly about the stresses associated with tenure and equality. All right. This part is really important to me because one of the things I notice is that people really stress out because they're not able to reach the bar because the bar keeps moving. So if you've ever tried to go for tenure, you think you have it, you've done everything you need to do, and someone has decided that you've not done enough. So these are the, the things that I was told and it worked for me. And that is make sure that your tenure process is very clearly articulated when you take that job. You need to know exactly what has to be done before you temp tenure. And also uh, keep an accurate record of the promises. So when I got ready to go up for tenure, because I didn't want to be chair, it's a long story. I, up until this year, I was the only African-American uh, music teacher in my department. And I'm the only female that they've ever hired in this predominantly black school, non-HBCU. But at the end, when they wanted to make me chair, and I was not tenured yet, and I didn't want to be chair and then have to fight for tenure, 
So I wouldn't take the job. Now they wanted to fight against my actually being tenured after trying to make me be the chair of the department. But the issue became that they said, well, I was hired for music ed and not the band director. And they had this old VHS recorder that the, the chairman at the time went and found the video and played the video where they actually told me that my head position was director of bands, not music ed. Because if it were music ed, I have to go back to school and get more than the 30 hours, I would have to do yet another degree. So that would have stopped me from being tenured. So what I'm saying to you is know your, have accurate record, God bless the situation that there was a video, but know what, you're, what you are worth, know your self worth, and don't get so caught up in taking a university job that you sell yourself short. Um, that I was told that by another faculty member because I was teaching the CP at Chicago Public Schools and you know the public school system made more than a university and he kept telling me to hold out don't take the job because I and I did go probably to the interview pretty cocky because I looked up everybody's salary because it's public I looked up the salary and I was like oh I can't even pay my house note with this job I can't afford it so I went in with you know I'm just going to do this but not thinking they'd be able to match my salary but holding out made them match the salary and that becomes very important because when they start requiring that you do so much you need to weigh what it is that they want you to do and how much they're going to pay you for it because if you're not making enough money and they're asking for hours and hours of your time, you know, beyond the school day, then uh, you're, you're not being compensated. And don't get so caught up. And this can really stress you out because you feel like you know, people look at a university position as if you've arrived once you've gotten that and, you know, now you're the person and everybody's looking up to you. And then if you leave that position, somehow you fail. And that makes no sense. First of all, we can't even exist without the people teaching band at the middle school, high school level. They're the ones that did all the work and then they bring the, you know, then we get the benefits of those students. So don't be afraid, you know, to take another kind of job if the people aren't giving you the respect that you need on, on the job that you're doing. Keep the accurate record, collect, collect all of your work, everything you do, you know, whether you do seminars like this or, you, you have to have, you know, keep the paperwork. So they do, in the end, they're supposed to have different tiers of things that you need to do in order to be able to be uh, tenured or promoted or whatever it is that you're looking for. You need to make sure that everything you do, you accurately can say, hey, I was nominated for the Grammy. You know, I have this, I have all of these things. So when they come up to it, it's no longer, well, I believe I should because I'm good. You know, like, I'm good because I have this portfolio. And I had a friend when I was teaching high school, so I had one of the largest marching bands in the city, and he told me to, uh, I needed a portfolio. And I was like, what is a portfolio? I didn't even know what that was. And he was saying a portfolio <laughs> is what I needed. And so we started collecting all the stuff for performances that we did, you know, at the high school level. So when I went to the university, I had this portfolio. So you want to keep your portfolio of all the stuff that you've done, the things that you've created, the music that you've written. So when you go be, be up to, you know, to be reviewed, then you know that you have satisfied all of the requirements. But make sure you know what the requirements are. Now, our school is a union institution, so they can't just fire us because they don't like you anymore. You, we have to follow the rules. And so you need to find out what the u rules are in your university, find out what your commitment is and what your university's commitment is to you. And then if when it's not right for you, don't be afraid to, lo to leave and, and do something different. And, don't, and, and it's their loss and not yours. So be prepared for post-tenure review too. Because sometimes after tenure, there are some schools that want to see that you're publishing and then find out what publish means. Because publishing as a performer is a different thing than publishing as a music history teacher. And you need to make sure that that institution understands the difference. You know, the way I explain it to our department is that um, without us, the music history, history teacher has nothing to write about. So you have to have that performer. You have to have those directors in order to give the history teacher something else to do. 
you know, so those are some of the things that I think will help make sure that uh, we have a chance of being tenured and retained uh, in the university level. Now we do know that as African American women, we are the last to be hired, absolutely. We just hired our first black choir director for this black school, you know, and she's female, yay. So this is our second person in our department, but we don't get a, a lot, we don't get a chance at the job. So those of you who guys are on the, the, uh, the line now, you know, my old high school band director, he taught us all as if we were all gonna be the greatest music teachers in the world. So I wanna put that out there for you all. Don't put the girls in the pinhole and decide that they're your secretary or they're supposed to be the ones that, you know, keep attendance. Teach them to play an instrument. Don't just give them a flute and a clarinet. Let them play the horns that they can get a gig with, too. And I always tell the students, if you, you know, play the biggest, if your student, your, I tell parents now, if your child is not all that good at music, give them the biggest, loudest horn on the field and they're still liable to get a scholarship or something. But we like the only way we're gonna see more women in this field is to be able to do more things. So if you never had a chance to play in a jazz band, then how are you gonna be the jazz band director? You know, and that'll leave you out of some high schools. You don't have to be that great at it, but you got to understand it, you know, and to be able to teach others to do it. You know, so I, I think that's what, and if I hit on what I need to hit on, Tamisha. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. We have discussed a lot today about our students. We talked about how to identify triggers or when there may be mental health crises. Um, and we've also talked about this with Falcon and staff. Um, before we talk about methods for coping with stress, I have two questions for our participants. Feel free to type your answers into the chat. Question one, think about the pandemic. What about the pandemic creates emotions of stress, anxiety, or depression for you? What about this pandemic has caused stress for you? And then a second question is that, do you feel that people react differently to stressful situations, especially during the pandemic? If so, how do they act differently? Do you feel everyone handles this stress the same way or do you feel we handle it differently? And how has a pandemic, um, and this is for students and professors, how has this pandemic created stress or anxiety or depression for you? How, is it, how has it affected you? So go ahead and um, put your answers in the chat. I see, um, okay, Keyshawn says, not being able to perform and being close to home. Um, in, indeed, um, some people, some students, when they decided to send people back to school, students got stuck there on campus because they had to quarantine, they couldn't go back home because their home may have been in a hot spot or a hot zone for, um, for the virus to, um, spreading, so they wanted to limit travel. And then being at school, being right there and not being able to perform, or you're doing all this practicing and you have nobody to play for. Like, you know, you can't, you know, it's only so many times you can have a concert for yourself. It's only, it's only so many times you can march around the same circle without seeing someone. I mean, that's even in a normal, a normal year. You know, I know when I was in school, I hated the away season because it would be so long if we didn't travel to some of those games before we finally had a game. And then when we did, we were out for blood. So, uh, you know, that alone can be stressful. Any other answers, don't, you know, don't be afraid to chime in. Um, how has this um, pandemic really affected you? Uh, not being able to physically work with students, headaches from looking at the screen for hours. Yes, indeed. Um, I know the K-12 students, they, they're giving us some of the students the blue light glasses. I think to kind of um, protect your eyes against the screen. I know that's something I need to personally look into because we spend hours on the screen teaching classes and then we spend hours on the screen looking at email, looking at Facebook, checking work and then doing our own thing as well. So headaches are a big thing and just that added stress, eye stress. Um, I wear glasses, I just chose not to wear them today, but I can attribute my poor eyesight to being on a computer screen, the stresses of my PhD program. And now I can't, I can't even drive down the street without having my glasses on. 
Um, if you have an iPhone, you can turn on the night function. It turns off most of the blue light. Yes, indeed. Um, but of course, if, if most of our students, if they're some of our students are attending classes from their phones, but a lot of them are still attending class. They're on tablets and laptops all day long. And then for many of our students, even if you're in college, you still have that video gaming itch. So when you finish your classes, you're still on video games hours in the day. And that can be very stressful as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, for our final question, we're going to go ahead and answer some questions that you may have about, um, about coping with stress, but I want to turn it over to Dr. Williams. If you can just talk to us about some coping strategies and maybe some activities we can do to kind of, you know, address stress, anxiety, and depression. And following Dr. Williams, I would like for Professor Smith to chime in as well. So some ways to maintain positive health is one, getting professional help if you need it. Um, staying connected with others, staying positive, um, getting physically active, beefing up your exercise regimen. Um, another thing that I would say personally is helping out others. If you're feeling down, um, do something for someone else um, and make sure you have a support system that you can identify when you're not feeling well. That's one of the things that I had to learn personally is who I could ask for help, when to ask for help. Um, even being a clinician, I'm working from home now, I can definitely attest to the headaches from being in front of the screen. And I'm working more, I feel now, that I'm working from home than I did at the office. Now I did do my work when I was supposed to do my work, but I would find downtime whenever I could. Now it's like, uh oh, got another client because mental health, uh, individuals are seeking out mental health now more than ever as a result of this pandemic. Uh, make sure you get enough sleep, uh, develop coping skills. If you're seeing a therapist or um, a psychiatrist even, or even a life coach, career counselor, um, develop some coping skills that will help you in your everyday life. Learn how to balance work and home for our professors or work and school for our students, making sure that you know it's not all work and no play. One of the things that I do is every day for 30 minutes, I am, it's all about me. I'm not a mother, I'm not a pet owner, I'm not a fiance, I'm not a sister, I'm not a friend, I'm none of that. 30 minutes every single day is dedicated and devoted to me. So that's one of the things we can do to help deal and deal with stress, anxiety, depression, and reduce and, and sometimes alleviate those symptoms. Thank you, Professor Smith. Yes, um, Dr. Dr. Williams is exactly right. Um, um, I like the uh, what she was saying about getting out there to help others because um, um, sometimes you you realize my circumstance doesn't look anything like that. You know the other person. So um, you know it's it's you know when you're dabbling in in, in providing blessings, you, it's, it's like playing in dirt. You're going to get blessed. You know so. Um, that's, that's helpful. Having an accountability partner, somebody who's calling you out, you know, so, um, I, I put in my planner and in my planner, what am I going to do for myself this week as far as self-care? So have somebody to go and, um, and, you know, have fun with, or, you know, just do something to feed yourself or your soul. Um, meditation, you guys, meditation, please explore meditation and yoga. So, uh, um, uh, I'm just going to say it. Um, many of my clients are like, that's white people stuff. But if white people are healthier or, you know, those white people that you know are healthier, have at it. I'm, I want some of that. So, um, and meditation doesn't have to look the same for everybody. You guys, I found out I meditate when I'm doing Zumba. So, um, you know, I don't care if you just start off with a gratefulness, a uh, gratitude um, meditation of just when you wake up before your feet hit the floor, just think about five things that you're grateful for. And if it, if it changes the tone of your day, Day, then you know meditation might be your thing um let me see um uh, i said accountability um uh, yeah looks oh i was just gonna say that oftentimes um you know we'll fake it till we make it and look good on the outside but it'll catch up with you so um you know just make sure that you make yourself a priority and then uh Dang, I forgot if it was Professor Stevenson was saying how 
um, we're at home and we're blurring our boundaries. You guys, that seem, it seems like I know that I'm at home and I'm not doing work and I, it could be awfully confusing because if this is my oasis, you know, and I like to, you know, go garden and this is the same place that I'm doing work and this is where this report is, you can start to blur the boundaries. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of your elder, my, I'm, my grandmother is from a, a one of 14 children. So she's all of, always telling me things that sound crazy to me, but then it comes back. That makes a lot of sense. But they say dogs don't pee and eat in the same spot. So you need to make sure those boundaries are put in place so you, you can let yourself know at five o'clock, I'm coming out of this office. I'm going to close that up. And now I'm going into my home life. So when you start to blur the two, you're going to start to get confused. And then you might be resentful because instead of eight hours at work, you're spending 12 and 15. And that's on you, boo. You know, so set those boundaries out there for yourself. Thank you. Um, like I said, very good points. And I want to point out something Dr. Williams said, how she sets aside 30 minutes for herself. I would like to promote you as we're reevaluating. I want you to reevaluate your goals. Think about why you're in school. Why am I here? What am I trying to do? What is it that I want in life? What is your end game? What is your ultimate result? And then think about how you're going to get there. I know many years ago, um, I, I ran across a motivational speaker that said, take a picture of what you want the most in life and put it on your mirror or put it on your refrigerator. That way, every day you're walking past and you're looking at what it is you're working for in life. So it kind of centers you and centers what your purpose is and what you're working towards so that you're always working with a purpose. Everyone's here for a reason. It, you may not all have the same path to get there, but you all have a goal that you're working on, whether it's a clearly laid out goal or whether it's something that you just think about in, you know, in a time where you're just reflecting on things. But also, I would encourage you to make an appointment with your middle name. Make an appointment with yourself. Put some time on your calendar, put it in your phone, put it in your Apple Watch, whatever you got to do. Make an appointment with your middle name. Somebody said, well, if I don't have a middle name, then make up a name. Use your line name or whatever you want to use, but make an appointment with yourself and make sure that you block that time off every day or at least three days a week. That way, if you see yourself on the calendar, you're not going to let anyone take the time away from you. You're not, you're going to treat yourself as important as you treat your friends. You're going to treat yourself as important as you treat your clients and your students. And you're not going to want to sacrifice your appointment or your you time. Take that time to go for a walk, listen to your favorite music, have a jam session, dance in your office, dance in your dorm room, whatever you want to do. Just go crazy with it for that 30 minutes or that one hour. But it is so important to make an appointment with yourself. But you know, make an appointment with your middle name. That way you, you make it that much more important and that much more meaningful. We call ourselves, you know, yeah, I can talk to Tamisha all the time, but if I make an appointment with LaShawn, I'm going to be there. I'm going to make sure that I give her that time that she deserves. Okay. Um, also, a, a colonel in the Marines made a good point. Start every day with a simple task or simple accomplishment. Start your day every day by doing something as simple as making up your bed. If you make up your bed every day, that is one task that you have accomplished for that day. And it's going to prompt you to accomplish something else in that day. No matter how your day goes, if your day goes good, great. If your day goes bad, at least you know you're coming home to a made up bed. And that is a good feeling to come home to your, your bed feels cooler when you, when you pull back the sheets and it's, it's a place for you to relax. If you come home that day and your bed is not made up, it's adding more stress to your day. But start your day by making up your bed. So that, that's just a good thing to just get you going. And that one thing that you've accomplished will prompt you to say, hey, that felt good. Let me see what else I can accomplish. So you might even fold those clothes that day that's been sitting there for the whole week. Okay. Or you might make it say, start, I'm going to start by going to my eight o'clock class. Okay. That felt good. Let me see if I can go to my 10 o'clock class today. Oh yeah, I did that. Let me go to lunch. That's something new. I usually work through lunch. So let me go to lunch today. Oh, I got a two o'clock class. Let me see what that's like. And then each day you'll start to see that your accomplishments are more than your failures. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, we, we've talked about a lot today. Um, ladies, I would like to give you the floor for a few minutes if you want to give any final thoughts before we go to our brief question and answer session. For my participant, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please go ahead and type your questions in the chat and we will take a brief question and answer session. But starting with um, Dr. Williams, if you would like to give any final thoughts. 
Um, the only other thing that I wanted to say is being mindful of our language and making sure that we don't activate triggers in other individuals. You know, we, we know what's going on with us, but we don't know everybody else's story. So there are certain things that may trigger someone else to have them really have a traumatic experience now i'm not saying you have to know everything about everybody but it is just be mindful of the individuals that you are around every day and you spend a lot of time with thank you so much professor smith any final thoughts um am i coming across all right can you hear me yes okay let's say my bandwidth is low i wanted to um just encourage people to um, protect your peace. And you know what I mean by that. You know what friend that you can go to and um, they're gonna give you sound advice or sage advice. And then you know who you can go to and they're just, um, I didn't like him anyway. And it's just breeding the negativity. I, I, I did this, this might be good for someone, but um, uh, I read somewhere that um, if you have something, um, a problem or something negative that you want to share, um, identify three people to share it with. And, and, and then, so what happens is I'm going to find three people that I trust and that I, I'm going to get good feedback from instead of just running your mouth and just sharing that with everybody, you know? Um, so you guys know what I'm talking about. There's some certain people that are going to um, deposit into your world and then there's certain people, they only make withdrawals. So you need to pay attention and then act accordingly um, to that. And then lastly, um, you guys, uh, clarinet, playing um, clarinet in the band saved me because um, I was the oldest of six children. And I could have just, <laughs> if I didn't have band and band practice, uh, 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 Don Juan could have came through and told me anything and I would have probably gone for it, to, you know, towards it. So I just need you to guys to... Um, Take care of yourselves because we need you. We need you as um, music majors to protect that art, and um, and then you you're gonna save others like me. So um, you know if you need something, reach out for it, please. Um, we're here. Um, you see, many of us look like you. Um, so just let us know if you need us. Thank you, uh, Professor Stevenson. Any last words? Uh, I wanted to say you all talked about blurring the lines and I know that before I, my feet hit the floor I will have settled a bunch of text messages and emails but I do have the one thing I have my shower preacher put my air my airpods in I have my favorite preacher in the morning and I get well they accompany me to the shower take a shower and it's like that's my time you know to try to, to center myself and one of the things I would I think that I would like to ask everybody to do is reach out to somebody because if you're feeling depressed or alone or whatever, then somebody else might be feeling depressed or alone. So call somebody, check on them, check on them regularly, see what they're doing, get them off the phone and get them off the, 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 the video games or whatever. I uh, had a best friend that moved out of town and I know when she moved, she moved by herself. She married somebody, but he had a job and she didn't have a job yet. I called her every day and she still, she thanks me for doing that. I called her every morning because I didn't want her to get depressed being far away from home and having no family there. So reach out to somebody else, check on them, check on the older people, check on, you know, just your friends or the people that used to be your friends who aren't your friends anymore, you know, and, and then protect, you know, your dream whatever it is that your dream is, protect your dream and move towards that. And all those negative things that pull you away from it, you might want to take that off your plate, you know, and go in another direction. Find a group of people that kind of think like you think, if you're thinking positively, you know, and sometimes you have to find people that help pull you up. Because if you're the only strong person in your group, then eventually they will may pull all of your strength. So find some people that you can build on somebody that's done thing. And I, I think one of the things that helped me, I like to read other folks' stories too, because nobody has that everything went perfect for them all the time in life story. But when you look and see how somebody else survived, you know, whatever it is, you, we're going to survive it. So think of yourself as already successful. You're here. Indeed. Thank you so much, Professor Stevenson. And Professor Sanders, any final words? 
Oh, yes. First thing, to piggyback what Roxanne was saying about you got to help each other. But what I do is on Wednesday, I call it Wellness Wednesday. And what I do is I check up on someone that I haven't talked to in a long time. And um, it also keeps that connection together. So if you got a high school classmate or somebody in college, either they dropped out or graduated, just check on them, see how they're doing. You know, you always talk about your family, but you want to you wanna try to check on that ace boon coon or that partner that you had that you used to run the streets and get in trouble with and just see how they're doing. Um, you got to try to stay positive with this pandemic and with uh, with this voting situation and, and, and everything else. You got to try to stay positive. My thing of it is, and I say this for my friends that are on Facebook with me, they know I always say the first thing that I say is we make roll call. When we make roll call every day, I am present. Just like everybody in this room is present. We have made present. We are present for the day. And what you have to do is you have to make sure that you have a plan. Don't let the day plan you. You let things run by and then the day goes by quick and then you have nothing accomplished. Also, we set, some of you guys set your goals too high. You need to have a goal for six months, a year, two years and then five years. You know, you should, you know, you can, you can also do day to day, but have short plans. When you start doing what I'm gonna do 10 years from now, hell, we want you to get out of school, first of all. So you got to make that plan. What do I need to do? What do I need to even take next semester? Because today was the uh, uh, Monday was the first day of registering for the spring. What do you need to take for next semester? What test do you need to get ready for? Do you need to get ready for the praxis test? Um, create joy and satisfaction for yourself. You can't make friends if you can't be a friend yourself, and you can't be a friend yourself if you don't love yourself. So if you don't love yourself, how are you gonna love somebody else or want someone to love you? So you got to do that. Um, what I've taught some of my students to do is. Um, some students like to write in a journal. Some students say, Miss Sanders, the journal is for the birds. Then I just say, look, take your phone and do a voice memo. Um, you know, and then you come back and, and put all your, your voice memos in a folder and then go back and listen to what you've said or done in that amount of time. And you can really just, um, you can really just really make yourself happy. One, uh, one app that I do like that I use that I use with the students is called Insight Timer. That creates meditation for you. It gives you music. It gives you um, um, anything that you need uh, sound-wise for whatever time or minute you have. So if you've got 10 minutes, if you get out of class or teacher cancels class and you say, you know what, this test has messed me up, uh, let, let me do 10 minutes of some meditation or some things. So Insight Timer is a great, uh, great uh, website for you. Uh, since we're all music um, in this field, music does soothe the savage beast, and the savage beast is stress. So in other words, what you need to do is you need to calm yourself down, whatever you like. Like, I'm going to tell you this, this sounds really crazy, and I know it comes out as me being an older teacher, but in the morning, I like to, I like to laugh, and I like to, of course, like you, I pray, I thank God for roll call, and then I listen to the most wretched song in the morning to make me get up and laugh and have a good time in the shower. So my song, which is the most terrible song in the world that I love, but it makes me groove in the shower, is, is my wonderful good friend, Cardi B, you know, um, that, you know, WAP, oh yes, I love WAP. I will WAP in the shower and have the best time in the world. So whatever song that makes you happy or that makes you move, you can do that to make you feel, I know, make you laugh. No, no. <laughs> and then, and then just other than that, just enjoy your life. You are in a wonderful field. We all are passionate in all of our fields, but our common goal in this whole webinar tonight is all about music. So you do the best that you can and get assistance from everybody, from not only your friends, but your professors, anybody on this panel, because we're all are gonna leave our information for you. So if you need someone to talk to an outlet or even just for a laugh for the day, you know, you need something to encourage you to make you move forward from day to day. So those are my last closing words. Thank you so much, Professor Sanders. And for a second there, I felt I had that feeling 
like I was a child hearing my mom say something that I didn't want to hear her say. So uh, Professor Sanders has been a long time mentor of mine. So I kind of felt like I should have left the room <laughs> when she said that. But um, definitely um, some good points, good words of advice. One thing I will leave for my music majors, especially, we spend a lot of time talking to our music education majors, but we do not spend enough time addressing our music performance majors. A couple of things I want you to um, work on. I know Professor Stevenson talked a lot about um, the portfolio for professors achieving tenure, but for your music majors, you need to put together a portfolio as well. Put together a plan for marketing, marketing yourself after graduation, because especially we have a lot of Virginia State students up here today. We have to really realize um, that life is bigger than Virginia State and that you're not just competing against the other music majors from state, you're competing, competing against majors from Virginia, from the East Coast, the West Coast, North, South, you name it, and from other countries for them same few positions that you want to get. So we want to make sure that you're marketable. And I think knowing early, I think communication is key. Knowing early what's expected of you helps to curb a lot of the stress that you may be feeling. For my performance majors, I'm going to go ahead and tell you because nobody probably has. You're self-employed when you graduate. That's not a conversation that we have because music education majors, we know you're going to apply for a job and that your job is going to help pay half your benefits. We're not having the conversation that those of you majoring in performance are on your own when you graduate. You're responsible for your own insurance. You're responsible for your own job search. You're responsible for your own headshots and portfolios and getting out there and finding those jobs. So I would encourage you to start early. Get yourself a professional toolbox. This is in one of my upcoming webinars that I plan to do later. It's part of one I previewed back in August called Revamping the Music Degree Program and teaching you how to have a professional toolbox and really reshaping what this degree program looks like at our HBCUs and how to help more of our music majors be successful and make it from enrollment to commencement. So these are some things I'll be talking about coming up. But one thing you need to think about is get a professional headshot. There are so many photography majors in your band programs and choral programs. Get someone to take a picture of you in your most favorite place on campus. Wear your best outfit, get your best hairdo or haircut, and go ahead and market that as your headshot. Get a resume together. Not the one we did in ninth grade, but get a decent resume together. Also, um, get a list of references together. Go to those professors. Get someone in the music department because we need someone to attest to your skills. But then get some of your favorite professors on campus. Go to your favorite cafeteria lady and get a letter of recommendation because believe it or not, they know more about you than some of your professors do because you talk to them more. Go to your dorm director. Get them to write a letter to talk about your character. Have all of that in your portfolio and be ready to market that. But not only have a hard copy, have a digital copy. We need to adjust to the age. We're going digital, 100% digital. So we're past the days of being able to print things out and have a hard copy. This is a time now to learn as much technology as you can and be flexible and open-minded. Music education majors, understand right now, you're not gonna get the dream program that you want coming right out of college. You might not even get the dream program you want 10 years out in the profession, but it's all in what you make the job. So don't just take a job because the check looks good. If you know that you're not ready to teach orchestra, don't take a job that requires you to teach orchestra. If you know you've never been in a jazz band, like myself, because I couldn't, um, I was told I played clarinet, so there was no place for me in the jazz band. I've learned later it wasn't true. But anyway, had I been able to take jazz band, I would have felt more comfortable teaching jazz band on the high school level. So just know your strengths and then whatever you're deficient in, just make sure that you're able um, to continue and, and, you know, and do those things and make sure you're well prepared. I think the more you know, the less stressed you'll be. And professors, we need to make sure we're sharing this knowledge and not be afraid to share this knowledge with our students. It's not privileged information. We shouldn't wait till the last minute to throw this on our students. They need to know coming into the program for their audition, what is required of the entire degree program and what is required for them to actually be in the field when they get out there. So those are just some things um, to add. Um, it's been wonderful. We've covered a lot today. I want to take the time. Um, do we have any more questions? Is there, will there be a way to assess the recording of the video after it ends? Yes, um, this is being recorded. Um, I'm going to edit the video and the video will be available in about a week. So that if you would like to go back and review it again, or if you would like to tell someone else about it, 
um, please do. Also, for someone who may have missed a call today, we're doing the same thing again on Friday at the same time. Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time, 5 Central, 3 Pacific. And I say that because we have people from all over the country on the call today. I would like to extend a sincere thanks to my panelists, Dr. Lanisha Williams, Professor Latroyo Banks-Smith, Professor Stephanie Sanders, and Professor Roxanne Stevenson for partnering with me on this project and giving of your time today. If you would like to contact any of us, um, ladies, if you would put your contact information in the chat box. And I would like to thank all of my participants on the call for your support and attendance. We hope that you gain some valuable information and look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Um, I'm going to post a survey link, so give me one second. And I would like you to fill out the survey if you would like more information and tell us how, how we did, tell us what things we can do better for our next webinar. So here's the link to our survey. So whenever you get a chance, we encourage you to please take that survey. Um, and of course, if you have any questions or any um, further comments um, that you can't think of right now, please feel free to email us. I'm also gonna put my information in the chat. Okay. Are there any more questions before we end our session today? Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again soon. We pray that you stay safe and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.